KSAT 12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we begin with a look at the numbers as they stand in Bear County right now. 772 confirmed cases. That's up 362 from this exact time just one week ago. 30 deaths, 18 more than this time last Monday. These numbers expected to rise tonight during the mayor's daily briefing. We'll have that for you coming up in just a few minutes. And here's a look at how the coronavirus is impacting surrounding counties. Many now well into the double digits here. Hayes, Guadalupe and Comal County with the highest numbers after Bear County. You can find these numbers posted on our website ksat.com. Just look for the Department of State Health Services map on our coronavirus homepage. Driving drunk on a sidewalk two summers ago, Rosalinda Olalde killed another motorist. And though she was sentenced to six years in prison, she is free on bond. And Paul Venable with an explanation and reaction from the victim's family. Just over a month ago, the trial of 24-year-old Rosalinda Olalde on intoxication, manslaughter, and assault charges ended. We assessed her punishment at the confinement at the in the Institutional Division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for a term of six years. Driving drunk, Olalde crashed into a car, killing 22-year-old Mario Velasquez Palau and injuring four passengers in his car. Olalde immediately filed an appeal to her sentence and was freed on bond pending the results. We're just frustrated because it seems like she's just trying to avoid any consequences. We just want her to, we just want justice. She said that the delay only extends her family's pain. It does upset me because it's like, just take responsibility. That's, that's all you could do now, take responsibility for a life that you took. Adding to their frustration, Velasquez said, is the time involved as the appeal works its way through the appeals courts. That could take months, perhaps years. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. $50 million in relief for small businesses in Texas and their employees announced as part of a small business initiative by Governor Greg Abbott today. It's a partnership between Goldman Sachs and the Lyft Fund. It's known as PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, through the Small Business Administration. Jesse DeGriato reports the big difference is that these are loans the SBA says can be partially or completely forgiven. Their sign says Caficionado Community Roasters is open, but it's more than a coffee shop. We thrive on people actually coming in and taking our roasting classes. And they can do that for their own or for their businesses. Yet owners Patricia and Clinton Butler say with only their drive through or walk-up open, their south side business now looks like this. Many of the sole breadwinners who were learning the trade or already roasting coffee no longer are. It's why the Butlers applied at Lyft Fund, a nonprofit micro lender. They're asking for about $20,000 through PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program for business owners. It's made directly to, um, to assure that these employees are not furloughed, are not having to you know, go on welfare and go on unemployment. The PPP amount that we receive uh, should hopefully provide us a bridge to be able to get on to the other side of this COVID-19 ordeal. The real prospect, if they qualify, of not having to pay it back would be even better. So we can get back into it, work hard, and just keep doing what we're doing for the city and for ourselves. Jesse De Guillado, KSAT 12 News. For information on how to apply for paycheck protection, we have a link at KSAT.com. You can find out up front if you qualify by answering a few questions on the website liftfund.com before starting the actual application process. A man who received a new experimental treatment for COVID-19 seems to be improving. That's according to his wife, who explained the process to our Devin Clark today. Ashley Hayden says her 47-year-old husband, Jimmy, is the first person in San Antonio to be transfused with plasma containing COVID-19 antibodies. It came from at least one former COVID-19 patient. Jimmy, who has been on a ventilator for about two weeks now, was able to FaceTime with his family yesterday. Ashley says she hopes her family's story will inspire those who may be able to help to do so. If you know you've had the, the positive result and, and can donate this plasma, it's so important for all these other sick patients. 
Jimmy is expected to come off the ventilator tomorrow, but will have to undergo rehab. This full story is on KSAT.com right now, and it includes information on how to donate plasma. As businesses with the capability to make masks for all of us to wear are busy at sewing machines, a local company is working to make them even better and safer. Filters for Air has been making air conditioning filters for 25 years. Today, though, it's working on a much smaller scale. Ursula Perry shows us how it's upgrading face coverings to protect from COVID-19. The machines at Filter for Air are humming along because air conditioning filters and clean air have never been more important. But on the other side of the room, another group of workers is cutting small squares of filter material to insert into those fabric face masks. This is actually a, a MER 14 piece of filter material that has a rating of 90 to 95 percent. So it's similar to the N95s, um, but it hasn't been tested for that. David Dilling has been in the filter business since a child. He says he was first approached by a hospital system to investigate how they could upgrade their reusable masks. And this is what they came up with. They were telling us that they were taking uh, metal from air filters that they bought at Home Depot and ripping out the media. And I talked to him, told him I could give him a better quality product, a higher efficiency filter. Since then, hundreds of thousands are being ordered by groups like the VA and University Health System. But they're also donating them to group homes and medically fragile populations. These filter inserts are actually made out of polypropylene. Now, some people are cutting up fiberglass air filters and using them instead. Not a good idea. Fiberglass is not meant to be breathed through or touch the skin. Fiberglass is dangerous next to the lungs and definitely not meant to be next to your skin. They come in packs of 20 and are 5 inches by 6.75 inches. You can go to the Filters for Air website and get more information on how to order your own. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Well, as we continue to learn new things about the COVID-19 pandemic, we still want to know what questions you, our viewers, have. You can submit questions anytime at ksat.com, and we will work to get those answers or those questions to the experts in an effort to bring you the best answer possible. You can also sign up for our newsletter. It's called SAQ Newsletter. We use that to provide answers to some of the more common questions we get, and we will send it straight to your inbox. And by the way, coming up later in this newscast, we will talk to Jenna Saceda Herrera from the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation about the economy and we'll include some of the questions hopefully that San Antonio viewers have. All right, I-10 and Frio. Usually there's a huge backup here as it heads especially towards downtown going away from us in this video. Not today. Nice sight to see out there. It's very nice to mm -hmm. see. And the sun, yeah, some cooler nice, weather. Nice weather to boot. Yeah, 69 degrees out there right now, Adam. Yeah, what a day. I mean, it felt kind of fall-like, mm -hmm. if you ask me. With the bright sunshine, looks warm outside, especially you know, considering it's mid-April. But no, anything but that warm. 69 degrees, our current reading. That's our high for the day, and the average high is 80. We're going to be far from that for several days. This evening, temperatures falling off pretty quickly. By 8 p.m., 64, and then 11 p.m., 54. And we'll be down into the 40s as early as 2, 3 a.m. and get ready for widespread 40s tomorrow morning. Aquifer down a little bit today. We're still about three feet above average. Oak is up there again. We're around in the bend in oak season, but it's high, mold high, grass pecan on the low end. We'll see you in a few minutes with the full forecast. Thank you, Adam. More than 100 residents and staff members at a Southeast side nursing home are battling the deadly coronavirus. As that fight continues, employees who work there continue to share stories about what they saw with our Dylan Collier. As the death toll at Southeast Nursing and Rehabilitation reaches well into the double digits, a second health care worker here has come forward to raise their concerns. A spokesman for Southeast Nursing says the facility instituted all federal, state and local guidelines in time to try and prevent an outbreak of the virus. But a nurse now says those guidelines were not always followed. I did the job and they know that. They know it. And they know I'm angry. I am angry. I'm angry. Coming up on the night beat, this longtime nurse will detail these specific incidents. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News.
We'll be checking in with Mayor Ron Nuremberg and County Judge Nelson Wolf for their daily COVID-19 briefing. It's coming up after the break. The Easter holiday will never be the same for one family who lost their loved one. A semi-pro football playing son and father who was shot and killed at this location yesterday. How he's being remembered and why they say he deserves justice. Linking the homeless with resources and mental health. We'll tell you about a new hotline the city has launched to help homeless during this pandemic. We continue to await the daily briefing from San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg along with County Judge Nelson Wolf, where they will give us the latest numbers. Uh, we are, of course, expecting those numbers to go up again today. Yeah, and as we mentioned off the top of the show, the latest so far stand at 30 deaths here in Bear County. A substantial portion of those, I want to say 15 or so, are from that nursing home. So, uh, you know, the hope every night that we do these updates and they bring us these updates here at 613 is that those numbers don't increase too much, um, but it is to be expected with the increase in testing as well. Yeah, and we also, I'm very curious to hear what the county judge has to say about the latest situation at the jail. I think there's very much a concern that that could be the next hot spot. Let's listen in. Tonight we're also joined by our Metropolitan Health Director, Don, Dr. Don Emmerich, and tonight is our COVID-19 update here in San Antonio. Uh, Don is joining us tonight and is going to provide us a little update on the work that we're doing uh, in uh, community equity. Uh, incredible work going on with our community health and prevention teams addressing some of the racial disparity uh, that we've seen in other cities around the country, and she's going to give us a brief on that. Her uh, team has been doing incredible work uh, really since her first day on the job which was also the first day we were uh, receiving evacuees uh, from the Joint Base San Antonio evacuation process. Um, tonight, our update on numbers, we have 794 total cases of confirmed positive COVID-19 infections. 135 individuals as of tonight have fully recovered. We still have 627 that are fighting uh, this infection. Unfortunately, we were uh, notified tonight of three additional fatalities, which brings our total deaths uh, from COVID-19 in our community to 33. Nearly half of those, 16, are from the Southeast Nursing and Rehabilitation Center. It is interesting to note that while 33 of the deaths in our community are among those 40 years and older, almost 40% of the positive infections in San Antonio are, the, are of those who are younger than 40 years old. So this proves again once, once again that this infection is uh, attacking people who are of all ages and we need to take our precautions. Uh, the hospital update, we have 88 patients currently hospitalized, 52 uh, additional patients who are receiving tests that are outstanding. Uh, we have 52 folks on ventilators tonight, excuse me, 52 in ICU, 37 on ventilators, and our capacity still looks good. We have 77% of available capacity with ventilators and 43% available staffed hospital beds. Tomorrow, as we've been discussing for a while now, uh, we do expect to receive some data analysis back from local uh, sources that show us a little bit about where this infection curve is going to lead us, when we can generally uh, assume our apex is going to be reached, and we plan off of that in terms of hospital capacity and medical system capacity. So we hope to have those data available in the analyses to show uh, to the public tomorrow, uh, so we'll be anticipating that. Uh, testing results, we have approximately 15, excuse me, 5,000 tests that have been run so far at the pre-approved testing facility at Freeman Coliseum. A full 8,000 tests on es estimated have been run total in Bear County. There is still a delay in getting results back from the federally approved, federally contracted labs. We still have roughly eight, 1,800 tests outstanding from the federally contracted labs, and we are working to receive those. Uh, from those labs. So those are the updates on the numbers tonight, and I'll turn it over now to the judge. Hey, thanks, Mayor. I know a lot of small businesses out there are suffering. I know how difficult it is. Uh, uh, we built a small business uh, selling roofing off the street corners and turned it into building material, and then we started a small little grocery store that led into Sun Harvest Farm. So I know how difficult it is for you, but this, what you're facing today, is much more than any of us had faced before. 
So Bear County, one of the first things we did was come up with uh, about $5.6 million dollars uh, for grants and for loans for small businesses. And we've used the lift fund to go through to be able to administer those loans. And just to give you an update tonight, uh, we've made 37 grants to small businesses. That totals um, $178,500. And they've gone to firms like Alamo Sale, Alamo Kitchens, D&D Printing Company, all across the spectrum of small businesses. Now, we've also... Uh, have a number of loans that have been made. Uh, we've loaned something like $706,000 to various firms, and uh, we'll close another $1.2 million uh, this week. That goes to some 81 different firms, and we still have about $3 million in loans that we can make available to the community. Uh, it spreads across the spectrum when you look at small businesses. That's the heart of our economy. It goes from construction to food services, to healthcare industry, to retail, and then a number of other services uh, that are provided from hair salons to uh, coffee shops to a, no a number of those. So we know that that's not a lot, uh, but we also know now you're able to go for an SBA loan, payroll protection uh, plans that are available out there for funding. Uh, another announcement, I believe today, some 50 million statewide, so we'll get a little bit of that money here. Uh, so be sure and follow up and find the right places to apply for these loans. And uh, we got to get through this and get you guys back on your feet. And thank you for what you're doing. I know it's a struggle for you and struggle for your employees. Thank you, Judge. I also want to remind folks that on TVSA today and also on the city's Facebook page, we had a town hall with for kids hosted by uh, Judge Chapa and myself to answer questions that children have about COVID-19. You can check that out on the city's Facebook page. I also want to remind you they can get information anytime about COVID-19 in our community. Just join our text program, text COSA-GOV to 55000 or go to our website at sanantonio.gov slash COVID-19. Remember to stay home, save lives, let's stay the course uh, and make sure that we have our, our community in good shape as we get through this. Now, before we go to questions from the media, I'm going to have uh, Dr. Emmerich now brief us on the community health uh, prevention teams that are again going through the painstaking work of getting the information out where it's most needed. John. Thank you. Th thank you, Judge. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I, it's just an honor to be here this evening to give you a, a little bit of information about some of the things that the community doesn't often hear, uh, what we are doing out in the community. So of course, you know from the very beginning, we have been discussing the importance of flattening the curve. And so flattening that curve is going to require the testing that we've just been talking about tonight, as well as doing policy. So the mayor and the judge's declarations that we have, that we have seen over the last several weeks are all very, very important. So we want to we want to we wanted to contain um, the COVID-19, and now we want to mitigate. We know that community spread is there. We know that's why we're encouraging folks to wear masks as well whenever you go out into the grocery store or to um, the mini marts or even the gas stations is to keep washing your hands, put that mask on so that we can, again, mitigate the spread. So when we look at that, and we're doing a really great job of that, we I think we're doing a, a, a fine job of continuously flattening that curve. We want to reduce the stress on our healthcare system system and of course keep our community safe. We know that there are more people in our community that are more likely um, to be at high risk for COVID-19. Unfortunately, you've seen that in some of our, um, in our nursing home situation. So we also know that there are people at risk who live in our, all over our community. So we're looking at those who um, are older of, oh, 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 yeah over 65 years of age. We also know folks who are have underlying chronic conditions. Um, all right, that is the Metro Health Director, Dr. Don Emmerich, talking about some of the steps that Metro Health is taking, going out to some of these vulnerable communities, and also maybe communities we talked about on Friday, communities that maybe don't have health care available. Uh, certainly health care inequity is an issue in San Antonio that they're actively trying to, to fight, trying to get out there to let people know what's going on, let them know that they can be tested. But the main news tonight, 794 total cases right now. And I was surprised when the mayor said 40% of the people, if that total, 
are under the age of 40. Yeah, that was surprising. 40% of the infected population yes. under the age of 40. So really, uh, everyone is prone to this. Another interesting point that we're going to continue to follow, especially into tomorrow, is that they're expecting some data analysis, kind of letting us know where are we right now, when is the apex, kind of helps them in their planning, and then gives us a better idea as the, as the general public of what to expect in these coming weeks and months. And yeah, so. and unfortunately, 33 people have died. That's three more than yesterday, 16 of them coming from the Southeast Nursing yeah. Home. All right, let's turn out to weather. 69 degrees out there as of now, Adam. Yeah, All like out there today, quiet around town here, but let's get right to the graphics and go into the panhandle of Texas. So we've got sunshine, but you look off to the north, yeah, you see that blue there? That is snow, snow falling in the panhandle in mid-April. Not only that, accumulating snow, especially along and just north of Highway 40 there in and around Amarillo, and that's where we're expecting one to two, two and a half inches overnight tonight into early tomorrow morning. Winter weather advisory going on in the panhandle. Unreal, huh? Look at the temperatures. 29 in Amarillo, head across the border into Guymon, 34. But then you get farther south into Texas, you see those temperatures warm up. 50s, 60s, and then 70s down near Laredo. 79 degrees, Catula 73. 69 here in town in New Braunfels at 65. Get ready for some unseasonably cool days, starting with, well, today and then into tomorrow morning. By early tomorrow morning, we'll see readings widespread in the mid to upper 40s. 46 here in San Antonio, Kerrville 41, Fredericksburg even, I think as cool as 38. You get to near Randolph, 48 degrees, Leon Springs, 46, and Lake Hills, 46 as well. So some chilly mornings ahead. Tomorrow afternoon, in the mid 60s, a little more cloud cover than sunshine tomorrow. Cool the rest of this week with a slight chance of showers by Friday and Saturday and even early Sunday morning. We'll be back with sports coming right up. Kyle Larson has been suspended indefinitely by NASCAR, suspended without pay by Chip Ganassi Racing after using a racial slur during an eye racing event last night. Incident occurred when Larson lost communication with his virtual spotter and was broadcast over the live stream event. I can see it. You can't hear me? Hey, Oof. Kyle, you're talking to everyone, bud. Yep, yeah, we heard that. Yeah, you can. NASCAR says Larson will not be eligible to return until he completes a sensitivity course. He did issue this apology through social media today. Yeah, I just want to say I'm sorry. Um, you know, last night I made a mistake and said the word that should never, ever be said. And um, you know, there's no excuse for that. You know, I wasn't raised that way. You know, it's just an awful thing to say. And I feel very sorry for my family, my friends my partners, the NASCAR community, and especially the African-American community. You know, I understand the damage is probably unrepairable, and you know, I own up to that. Um, but I just wanted to let you all know how sorry I am. And, you know, I hope everybody is, is staying safe during these crazy times. Thank you. Now, here's NASCAR's statement on Kyle Larson's suspension. NASCAR has made diversity and inclusion a priority. We won't tolerate the type of language used by Kyle Larson during Sunday's iRacing event. Our member con conduct guidelines are clear in this regard, and we will enforce these guidelines to maintain an inclusive environment for our entire industry and fan base. Last week, NASCAR driver Bubba Wallace quit an iRacing event just nine laps after he wrecked out and gave up. His sponsor, Blue Emu, then fired him. Pro Football Coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. The broadcast of the NFL Draft will be a combined effort this year between ABC, ESPN, and the NFL Network over three days. That was announced today as the NFL will still hold its draft on April the 23rd through the 25th, with ABC airing a separate draft broadcast on Thursday and Friday, and then simulcast ESPN NFL broadcast on Saturday. The draft was originally supposed to take place in Las Vegas, but due to the coronavirus that has been canceled, the draft broadcast will originate from ESPN's headquarters in Bristol, Connecticut, with a host and commentators adhering to social distancing guidelines. Other reporters and analysts will work from home, and NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell himself will introduce picks from his home in New York. The broadcast will also serve as a draft-a-thon that will not only pay tribute to the health care workers and first responders, but also help raise money for six national nonprofits during the COVID-19 pandemic. With Travis Frederick announcing his retirement from professional football, the Dallas Cowboys could use the draft to find his replacement. Frederick announcing his retirement after returning to play the entire 2000 
2019 season after missing the entire 2018 season while battling Guillain-Barre syndrome, which attacks the nervous system. The Cowboys are scheduled to pick at number 17 later this month and have a, spent a great deal of time on virtual interviews. One of the possible replacements that have cost the Cowboys' eye here is Michigan's Cesar Ruiz. And according to Peter Keene, the Cowboys could trade down much like they did in 2013 to get Ruiz and maybe another draft pick. Shaped up in the Chicago Bulls organization, general manager Gar Foreman is out after a decade in that role and 22 years with that team. His firing comes just days after the Bulls hired the Denver Nuggets general manager, Arturis Karnasovas, as the team's new executive vice president of basketball operations. The Bulls also announcing that former Spur John Paxson will remain with the team, but not as the executive VP of basketball, now as a senior advisor for basketball operations. So a lot of shakeups while the NBA is on hi hiatus right now. We expect more to come before this is all over. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. We'll be right back. Well, deadly storms continue to move across the United States with tornado watches now stretching into the Northeast. Yeah, this is we're learning of more deaths in the South and some communities enduring catastrophic damage. ABC's Trevor Alt has the latest from New York. The death toll from a slate of wicked weather has climbed to at least two dozen people, with fatalities now reported in Mississippi, Georgia, South Carolina, and Arkansas. Letitia Dillon says her brother was killed after getting caught in the storm outside his Mississippi home. The wind picked up his house and picked up his whole house, and it swung, and it just tore everything. Everything just ripped off, and... Everything was gone. It was, it was gone. In Georgia, a man was killed while sleeping after a tree fell on his home. This house lifted entirely off its foundation, thrown into the middle of the street. We just can't believe it. That house was built in 1950. This is just, this is a nightmare. Four states declaring states of emergency. Governors in South Carolina and Louisiana now surveying the extensive damage. The mayor of Monroe, Louisiana, hesitant to designate shelters for people misplaced in the midst of a global pandemic. Normally we would talk about opening shelters. Right now, shelters are the last resort because of the COVID-19 pandemic. These storms now moving through the Northeast, forcing some COVID-19 testing facilities in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and New York to close because the weather is too severe. And as this threatening weather stretches through the mid-Atlantic, there's now tornado watches in effect from Washington, D.C. up to Philadelphia and in nearly all of New Jersey, where there's already several downed trees and power lines. Trevor Ault, ABC News, New York. The U.S. Navy says a sailor who tested positive for COVID-19 on the USS Theodore Roosevelt has died of that disease. The sailor reportedly admitted to the intensive care unit of a U.S. Navy hospital on Guam Thursday. In addition, a U.S. defense spokesperson says four more sailors were sailors from that ship were transferred to the hospital over the weekend for monitoring. The officials said they're all in stable condition. None are in the ICU or on ventilators. The Navy says nearly 600 sailors on that ship have tested positive for the coronavirus. The impact of the pandemic on the ship at the center of a controversy that led to the resignation of acting Navy Secretary Thomas Modley last week. Well, Good Morning America anchor George Stephanopoulos announced this morning that he has tested positive for COVID-19. Stephanopoulos said he doesn't have any symptoms. He says he's feeling great and hasn't experienced fever, chill, chills, headaches, coughing, or shortness of breath. His wife, Allie Wentworth, announced she was diagnosed with the coronavirus about two weeks ago. Stephanopoulos' diagnosis comes on the heels of two other well-known news anchors testing positive, CNN's Chris Cuomo and Brooke Baldwin. Healthcare workers testing new protective face shields at a healthcare center in Boston. The new shields developed from an existing design. They're no longer regular, they're no longer than regular face shields, which means they provide greater protection and cut the risk of infection. Dr. Edward W. Boyer of Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston said the new shields are better than the personal protection of equi equipment that they were getting.
The coronavirus Q&A is kind of what we call this segment where we try and get some of the answers uh, to some of the major local questions that are out there when it has to do with COVID-19. Jenna Saceda Herrera joins us now. She is the head of the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation. Jenna, thank you for being here. I, I am familiar with EDF. You and I have talked many times. Um, I know usually you're out recruiting and selling San Antonio. Has all that changed with COVID-19? It has, Steve. Uh, first and foremost, let me thank you and ECs for having me on this evening, although I do wish that it was under better circumstances. Uh, and you're 100% right. Uh, we have shifted our focus entirely at the EDF, uh, really from selling the San Antonio community to better serving the community right now, uh, with a specific focus on supporting our small businesses right now in their time of need. And speaking of those small businesses, what, what are, what's some of the feedback you're hearing? Can you talk to us about some of the things that they're experiencing and, and what you're hearing from them? Of course. I mean, first and foremost, um, our small businesses are concerned about cash flow. Cash flow and, of course, their um, the employees' safe and well-being. And so uh, we are in direct communication with them through multiple chambers and multiple partners around the broader community. But ideally... Um, we can address uh, situation one and situation two through a lot of the SBA loan programs, specifically the payroll protection program um, that is obviously uh, driven by the federal government. That was just announced today, too, that the state is also going to pick up some of that through the lift fund and some of the other things we talked about. How about for individuals out there? I know that you have to be you have to be looking at unemployment numbers. You have to be talking to Texas Workforce Commission and people like that. I mean, what is the impact that you're seeing on some of the individuals in our community? Sure. So we're in lockstep with the TWC and also Workforce Solutions Alamo here in San Antonio. And just to put it in perspective for you, Steve, in March alone, uh, we saw in the greater Bear County region about 56,000 unemployment claims. Compare that to just February of this year when we were sitting at about 3,000. Uh, that's a drastic difference. And so obviously uh, unemployment, filing for unemployment uh, is the immediate need. Uh, but then of course there are opportunities uh, to upskill right now and Workforce Solutions Alamo is providing several different uh, training programs and in collaboration with Geekdom and, and Code Up and so many other organizations in San Antonio. Can you, can you talk to us about some of the efforts underway um, to just kind of align the business community? Of course. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we have got to get cash in the banks of our small businesses so that we can keep San Antonians employed and ideally so that we can get San Antonians back to work. Um, all of our local banks and even some of our larger banks that have a presence in San Antonio right now are actively working um, to get folks applied for these programs. Um, but as you can imagine, they're all backlogged right now and they're all trying to integrate these federal programs while they're simultaneously trying to get people enrolled. Uh, so what we're doing in partnership with UTSA is trying to figure out a way that we can streamline that process and provide uh, pre-bank concierge or hand-holding services uh, in advance of getting to the point where you can apply uh, and actually hopefully streamline that process and reduce backlog for our local banks so that they can take on additional clients because right now that's a significant challenge for them. More to come on that program specifically with UTSA Small Business Development Center. Great. T talk about the recovery though. How quickly do you think San Antonio can recover from an economic shutdown like this? Well, we're a resilient community. We're a resilient economy. Um, and so if you look at different benchmarks, what's happening in China and what's happening around the world, uh, you've seen that there is a quick recovery and there's a quick response. And I believe that the way our community rallies together, the way our public sector and our private sector comes together, um, I think we are also going to see that quick turnaround. But as you both know, um, there's a balance between the health implications of where we're at dealing with the pandemic and then, of course, um, the impact to the economy and ideally getting the economy back to recovery. Um, but we're working today uh, with the mayor and the judge. I think they've done an incredible job with leaning in and managing our community during a crisis. Um, but we're working with them directly to figure out what that looks like and what protocols need to be in place before we can move um, to reopening San Antonio for business. Um, obviously, we're in rescue mode now, um, but ideally we move to recovery. And when we do, we are prepared to bounce back uh, more quickly and more robust than ever. And Jenna, before we let you go, any last minute message to our business community out there who may be watching tonight? I would just say thank you for what you continue to do uh, in employing San Antonians and supporting San Antonians this far. Um, I would say today you need to make sure if you haven't already applied for PPP and other 
uh, SBA loan programs, you need to do that. You've got to get that cash in the bank. That steady cash flow obviously allows us to keep our employees on the payroll um, and hopefully make it through this crisis. Jenna Sacedo Herrera with the San Antonio Economic Development Foundation. Thank you for your time. We'll see you at 9 and then again at 10. Thanks. And we'll be right back. Hope everybody had a wonderful and safe weekend. Uh, I know I did. It was yeah. just a beautiful Easter weekend with your, my family. Your and Easter egg hunt yes, went all right. It went okay, yeah. Okay. And today, what, what a day. What a blessing beautiful. today. 69 yeah. degrees outside. Beautiful day. And yeah. even yesterday, Easter was a nice day. You know, it it was. A great day. Uh, I smoked some ribs and I tried something new. Yeah. I put some peeps on skewers oh and God. smoked them. How Those were smoked be, peeps? That's a good idea, actually. Like s'mores, kind of. Kind of. Kind of. Peeps. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not so much. Not a big fan of peeps in the first place, so I'm Oh, I not love exactly, them. Yeah, see, I'm not a good critic for it anyway, but just having fun with the kids trying Did to Did the kids <laughs> like it? That Oh, of course, did they? Right. Yeah, <laughs> anything full of sugar, they love it. All it really did was melt down the peep a little bit more and cause it to kind of sag and droop off the little skewer stick. So <laughs> I've got an offset smoker, and so uh, uh, you know you your smoke chamber, then the tube going up, and right on that that tube, that's the pipe. That's where we <laughs> put the peeps. <laughs> so earlier this morning, 46 degrees for the low temperature. That's good 11 degrees below average. Get used to that. We're going to be in that same boat the next couple of days. This afternoon, we actually made it up to 70, which is 10 degrees below average. The record today, 100. Just shows the potential of this time of year. 69 degrees right now, dew point of 41, a relative humidity of 36%. The dew points down, humidity's down in terms of the mugginess. We don't have that thick humidity anymore. Right now in Floresville, Stinson, Pleasanton, all at 67, you go to Hondo 71, but overall a beautiful evening. And if the high mold count and the high oak pollen count doesn't bother you, open up the windows, let that fresh air circulate. It feels very fall like out there. Farther west and southwest of town, lower 70s for the most part, 72 Uvalde along with Carrizo Springs. Now tomorrow morning, you're going to feel that bit of a chill in the air again, you know, relative to this time of year when we usually start the day well into the 50s, near 60 degrees. When you wake up tomorrow, well, if you're waking up at 7 a.m., I know times are different these days. This is often a bus stop time for people, but I know it's a little bit different right now. Anyway, early risers that want to venture out 7 a.m., 46 degrees here in San Antonio. I think Fredericksburg, upper 30s, Junction, upper 30s, Kerrville, right around 41 degrees. And this is well below average. So we're going to be in this boat here the next couple of mornings. And by Thursday, we'll start to see those mornings get a little bit warmer, but still about 10 degrees below average at 49 degrees. Then we get into the weekend and we're back closer to where we typically are this time of year. Very quiet across South Texas and most of the state. But where we have the activity, oh, it counts. It's a pretty big deal here. Northern Panhandle, right along Highway 4 or, or Interstate 40 and north around Amarillo, that's snow, okay? Don't change the color settings on your TV. That blue is actual snow falling in the panhandle. And parts of the panhandle could see one to two inches, maybe two and a half inches in some localized areas. 29 right now in Amarillo, but you go to Lubbock and it's 50. Look at that difference there. And you get to junction at 63, and as I mentioned, upper 60s around town. So there's some activity to the north of us, but overall it's a pretty quiet weather pattern this week. No shot at rain the next several days. By Friday, Saturday, we give it a 20% chance. So overall, we're looking at a pretty dry pattern here. As we get into tomorrow morning, 46, afternoon, 66, and then we'll be in the 70s for highs by Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. But we don't get back into the 80s until Sunday with it maybe a few morning storms. Nice and slow. Isn't that fair? <laughs> like All smoked right. peeps. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Adam. Yeah, like smoked peeps. <laughs> In case you missed it, coming up next. The numbers across the board are growing, some continuing to go in the wrong direction across Bear County. Right now, there are more than 130 survivors of COVID-19 in the county. That's about 17% of all the cases, which currently sits at more than 770. 27 people have died in Bear County. More than 600 cases remain active. A look at the bigger picture. There are more than 13,000 positive COVID cases in Texas. That's roughly out of 130. 
33,000 tests that have been given. More than 280 people have now died of the virus, and more than 2,200 patients have recovered. One family that feared for the worst is now hopeful that a man put on a ventilator due to COVID-19 will actually recover. That man is the first person to receive a plasma donation with COVID-19 antibodies as part of an experimental treatment right here in San Antonio. Now, if you ventured out to work or maybe to the grocery store, one thing you cannot miss all over town is all the construction that's underway. That's because things like housing projects and road repairs are considered essential. And the city says right now some of the construction you see is more crucial than ever. All right, Military City USA, check this out. The Air Force Thunderbirds doing their part to provide a much needed distraction for COVID-19 patients and frontline healthcare workers. And they perform this flyover above every hospital in the Las Vegas Valley over the weekend. Their hope to recognize first responders, healthcare professionals, and other workers who are on the front lines battling the coronavirus pandemic. Tomorrow morning, you'll notice a bit of a chill in the air. Widespread 40s. Leon Springs, 46. Bernie, about 44, along with New Braunfels. South side of San Antonio, right about the 50 degree mark. Then we'll make it into the 60s by tomorrow afternoon. Thank you, Adam, and thanks so much for watching the 6 o'clock news. We'll see you online at 9 and, of course, right back here on the Night Beat at 10.